Come, dear Christ, and be among us, helping us to heed your invitation to draw near to you and receive your healing touch. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Diocese of Olympia, you've made it. (laughs) After the resignation of Bishop Greg Rickle over two years ago, being shepherded by provisional Bishop Melissa Skelton for 18 months, conducting an intentional and spirit-led 14-month search process followed by a quick four months between election and consecration, being a little shy of the canonical requirements, I'll let you know. And now with 42 days since Holy Cross Day, but hey, who's counting? It's finally all done. We've made it. One of the first questions I was asked when I arrived at D House in early August concerned the theme for this convention. The pre-planning team had suggested hearing from Isaiah 43. I'm about to do a new thing, says the Lord. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Not a bad guess, given all that we had been through and the beginning of this new era of ministry. However, I had spent the previous months packing boxes, sorting through kitchen gadgets, purging all sorts of books, and saying goodbye to a congregation that I deeply loved. And I had just arrived after a six-day road trip of over 3,000 miles with my son Noah from Boston to Seattle on America's longest interstate, all while having a dog in tow. When I was asked that question, I wasn't even sure which time zone my body was in. And so I asked, well, what about Jesus saying, come to me and I will give you rest? (laughs) Not fully comprehending yet that when a bishop suggests something, it's pretty much taken as a final response. (laughs) And so here we are with this lesson from Matthew's Gospel front and center and the call from your new bishop that focuses less on boisterously singing together, come labor on, and more on hitting the pause button and taking a deep breath because we need it. It's been a whirlwind, friends, and not just since Greg resigned. We've been in the vortex since at least Friday, March 13th, 2020, when the world shut down for COVID. 241 weeks and one day ago, for those of you keeping score at home. So can we stop for just 10 seconds right now? And in silence, take a couple of deep breaths. Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and carrying those heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus says this to his disciples and to us. And if I were to ask right now, what are some of those heavy burdens that you've been carrying? I suggest that I might hear things like the stress of running a parish post-COVID, or financial realities or the rising anxiety in our kids, or those ongoing conflicts in the Holy Land and Ukraine, or not even having enough volunteers to run a Sunday morning, or racial distress, or the climate crisis, or a presidential election that can't come soon enough except for what we fear might happen afterward. We are bone tired, you and I, And the weight of the world is on our shoulders, and we really don't know how it's all going to play out, 
but it doesn't look good. A report came out last week from the Hartford Institute of Research which detailed how many of the clergy in America are burned out. It's titled, I'm exhausted all the time, a quote from one of those pastors. And this wasn't necessarily news to me as an American clergy person, but rather confirmation that we need rest and healing due to the ongoing stress of our world. And not just those of us who are ordained, mind you, but lay folk too. We're all constantly connected to our work and available on our cell phones and email 24 seven. And we're trying to run our parishes like we always have. And it's all a bit much. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus invites us to follow him, to learn from him, to become his disciples. But friends, we have to respond to him. If I were to name the most significant issue for us in the church today, it's that we become too familiar with the way of Christendom, of the church, of the empire, and not familiar enough with the way of Jesus. In Christendom, we've connected the values of our world with how we understand success within our congregations. In this framework, when two or three are gathered together, we're considering how to shutter the building and make better use of the land. As such, we've created a culture that believes congregational development is about a simple way to get young families into the pews and through the front doors so that they can pledge and help out with the Christmas fair. We've established a piety that links vitality to budgets and Sunday attendance rather than asking about discipleship. And we've grown accustomed to maintaining the status quo rather than expecting to address the ways in which our lives might need to change to become more aligned with the gospel. The way of Jesus is transformational, friends. Of saying to our 24-7 culture that we will make time for a regular Sabbath rest. Of laying aside our rampant consumerism in order to generously offer gifts for the spread of Christ's realm of refusing to believe that our self-worth is inherent and connected to how much we get done, of coming each week to the table so that we can receive Christ's body and blood and find renewal and restoration and hope because that's really what church is about, of letting go of our idols of security and power and casting our lot with the one who had no place to lay his head who dined with outcasts and with the marginalized and ultimately died because the empire deemed him a threat. Come to me and I will give you rest, he says to us. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. That's the church we long to be. But we must be honest that the church has not always been a place where all people can find rest. I've only been in this diocese for a short time and already I've heard stories of how we've not always been receptive of others, never mind that larger history of Christianity. Historically, of course, the church and we Christians have determined who's in and who's out based on some poor misreading of scripture and wanting to remain in power with those who we think are leading us. These past weeks, I've heard how leaders in our diocese chose to close historically black churches during the civil rights era because they somehow weren't diverse enough. There's a painful reality of the Japanese internment here in Western Washington and how we never reestablished the mission of St. Paul's in the Kent Valley after that time. 
While we've not yet found evidence in our diocese for establishing indigenous boarding schools, we know full well that many of those who were in the majority at that time saw such schools as good and proper, a way to assimilate indigenous children to become more Anglo in their lives and beliefs through the means of control and abuse and fear. LGBTQ folk have a long history of being traumatized by the church and of not finding a place of welcome even within our own denomination. Women have been told that they are too emotional, too je ne sais quoi, to be in ordained ministry. And even now within our wider denomination, they are paid less than their male colleagues while doing similar work. While I don't think that we officially track such things here in Olympia, I wouldn't be surprised by similar results. And finally, BIPOC clergy often experience micro and macro aggressions within their own congregations by people who might mean well, but remain somewhat naive to all of this, which is an awful lot to take in, I know but we cannot find rest for ourselves if we do not name with honesty and integrity what has been and what remains true for beloved people in our midst. So let me, as your bishop, say to this to those of you who have been impacted. I'm sorry. We were wrong. We harmed you and your forebears or people who were like you in such a way that rest and healing were never really an option. Those who preceded me in this office did not always fully offer the love and care of Jesus, and my own efforts will be lacking due to the sad reality that white supremacy is baked into the system. It's in the DNA of how we have done church in this country for centuries and how we do it still, and it's a sin. So please forgive me. Forgive this diocese of ours as we try our best to pattern our common life after the way of Jesus. And please know that this is not a way for me to quickly pivot and move on to other things, but rather to begin an era of listening and truth-telling and seeking repentance and reestablishing relationships in a new way so that all of God's children might fully experience the rest and care offered by Jesus through the ministries and congregations of our diocese. We heard this morning the call to engage in a weekly Sabbath as part of the Ten Commandments. The Israelites were to remember that they had once been enslaved by their oppressors in Egypt who required a seven-day work culture, demanding that they never rest. God wanted them not to forget that God had delivered them from that culture of excessive work and so in their new life in the promised land, no one in their community, not even their animals, should be engaged in production on the Sabbath. Frequently in the Torah, a similar injunction was given of resting croplands and fields every seventh year. After six years of planting and harvesting, the field was to lay fallow for that Sabbath year, allowing whatever would naturally spring up do so to feed both humans and animals. Taking a rest was good for both human beings and animals one day each week and for our land every seventh year. Within the past month, two major hurricanes have struck the southeastern United States, causing at least at this point $130 billion worth of damage and killing more than 260 people. Both were deemed storms of the century while striking barely two weeks apart from each other. And cleanup work will take years. Recent reports detail that some there in the mountains of North Carolina are still without power and clean water. 
And the root cause of these storms is climate change with warmer water temperatures causing quicker storm development while also causing the atmosphere to hold more moisture. There are other consequences that we know of, of course, of climate. Wildfires and the loss of species, increased drought, excessive heat domes, mudslides and flooding, and we could go on. And the impact has been and will be greater on those who are poor and especially those in the developing world. When I met last month, right after my ordination with Bishop Ernie Morrell of the Episcopal Diocese of the Southern Philippines, we discussed our partnership, that carbon offsite, offset cooperative mission. In this program, we here in Olympia are encouraged to send funds to that diocese so church members there in the Philippines can plant trees on our behalf to mitigate our use of fossil fuels. The congregations there have made planting trees a sacred event. It's connected with seasons and litur liturgies, and they go out after worship to plant for us. It's an amazing program. And yet I was struck by one question from Bishop Ernie. He asked me if we were doing anything else as a diocese to curb our use of fossil fuels beyond switching out light bulbs or perhaps installing solar panels. Were we limiting our consumption in any way, he asked, or were we just sending them money when we remembered to do so as an act of assuaging our guilt? That was not an easy question to answer because I'm not sure that we are doing enough. We've not engaged in consistent ways to limit our carbon use, nor are we seeking collectively to become carbon neutral within our diocese within a certain time frame on our own. Bishop Ernie reminded me that the rise in sea level and increase in storms is having an immediate and lasting impact on their lives, causing, causing much harm and destruction and yet, he said, he remains hopeful for the future of the church. The founder of the Green Sabbath Project, Jonathan Scors, suggests that we intertwine the call for Sabbath rest and the need for climate justice. He seeks to encourage all people, and especially those of us of the Abrahamic faiths, to observe a weekly Sabbath and minimize our impact on the environment at the same time. The call of their organization is simple. Don't drive, don't shop, don't build. One day each week. They tell us it's the easiest way to reduce our carbon use by 14% without any scientific or economic or technological solutions. It's simply behavioral and one that is mandated by scripture, he reminds us. On the Green Sabbath website, they display a quote from James Gustav Speth, the co-founder of the Natural Resources Defense Council, and he declares, quote, I used to think that the top global environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation." End quote. We need to offer rest for our world by changing our hearts and consuming less and resting from our labors one day each week and we can do this simply by modifying our behavior and changing our ways. Because when it comes down to it, friends, that really is what our lesson this morning from Matthew is about. Jesus tells us to come to him in order to lay down those heavy burdens that we've all been carrying so that we might find rest. And then subsequently, he encourages us to take upon us his yoke so that we can learn from him. 
Now, yokes are not something we see very much in our industrialized and technologically centered worlds. Often we see them in photos in those more agriculturally focused communities with those two oxen joined together by a wooden cross piece as they prepare to, to plant a field or pull a load. Those animals work in unison, able to accomplish so much more together than they ever could alone as they are bound to one another and directed by the one who cares for them. When we bind ourselves to Jesus, our ways of doing things, of looking out for ourselves, of satiating the desires that we have to consume more, all of it comes under his direction and care so that we might choose a better way. Jesus tells us that his yoke is easy and the burden is light. It doesn't require much of us, but it does require something. He asks that we commit to his way of love and become connected both to one another and to him. That we recognize that what we do in our own lives matters to others and to our world. That the call to discipleship, to following him, will both revive our weary souls and also come with a cost. And frankly, I think that we long to take on that costly discipleship to follow the way of Jesus and to make a significant impact in our communities and in our worlds. Christendom is in fact dying and its downfall has been reported all over and yet it's hard for some of us to imagine any other way of being the church. And so the fear of survival sets in. And yet Jesus offers us a different way to come and find healing from him to restore our souls and address the brokenness in our relationships with others and with our world. And that is work that I've heard you say here in the Diocese of Olympia, that we are deeply committed to do that. I'm very happy to announce this morning that we have received a substantial gift, allowing us to acquire Harmony Hill, the retreat center located adjacent to our own St. Andrew's house. It's there in Union on the Hood Canal. Harmony Hill has long offered programming and retreats for those impacted by cancer and their families to find healing and wholeness. And this new ministry of our diocese will be called the Sacred Waters Center, providing healing for ourselves, for our divisions, and for creation itself. Dan Oberg, the director of St. Andrew's House, will be our interim director of Sacred Waters. And his steady hand will allow us to continue the work at St. Andrew's as a place for renewal, while also offering the programs offered by Harmony Hill to continue, and then giving us time so that we might dream with both our canon for multicultural ministries, Carla Robinson, and our multicultural ministries coordinator, Adrian Elliott, and their work, and a whole host of others from the circles and others within our diocese about what the future might hold in that place. As you might well imagine, this didn't just materialize in the last couple of weeks when I became your bishop. <laughs> and so as such, my deepest gratitude goes to Archbishop Melissa Skelton, Bishop Provisional, along with many others who worked hard over the past many months to make sacred waters a reality. And I would invite you to join with me in giving our thanks to her and them. <laughs> sacred waters will be a place of refuge and healing and hope in the years to come. And I cannot wait to see what God does there. Finally, friends, we need to support each other in the midst of our worlds. One of the things that I plan to do as your bishop is to more fully establish our 10 regions as places of connection and shared ministry. With many of our parishes being led by a single clergy person, it's important for clergy in each region to gather together for conversation and prayer and support from one another. 
and additionally lay leaders of our congregations will, can benefit and learn from each other to help us become more faithfully disciples of Jesus. Relationships are key in all of our endeavors, providing us with companions on the way, people who can help us shoulder the load. Jesus' yoke is one that we share with one another as we journey through the chances and changes of this life. And that way is often marked by difficulty and pain. And so we can help come alongside each other to remember that Jesus' call is to come to him because we need that healing touch from Jesus. We need to draw near to him in order to find renewal because we're carrying a lot and we're bone tired. So on this day, I invite us to come to one another for prayers of healing, to come to this table and be fed by Jesus And in doing so, stake our lives on the truth that he came so that we and our world might have hope and joy and renewal and peace and love. He came so that we might find rest for our souls, both now and in the age to come. May it be so. Amen.